Hi, thanks for joining me for today's episode. I am really excited for this one. We are talking about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight by Author Unknown, published sometime in the 1300s. No one knows for sure. And the version I read was translated by Keith Harrison. And then the movie is The Green Knight, directed by David Lowry, released in 2021. And before I get into it, I just want to talk about his name, Gawain. So initially, like I had heard of this knight back like when I was in high school, I was into King Arthur movies and books and stuff. And so I remember seeing the name Sir Gawain, and I would pronounce it Sir Gawain. And that is one way to pronounce it, but it seems like the more frequently used is Gawain. But no one knows for sure what the connect correct pronunciation is so really you could say it however you want and that would be fine and in the movie David Lowry he let the actors decide like he didn't say this is how you pronounce it he was like just pronounce it however you think it should be and for the most part people seem to say Gawain though it's the common one but I might end up saying Gwen I might end up saying Gawain but either way we're talking about the same guy so I know I'm a little late posting about this considering it's already been out for over a month Ideally, when I'm posting about a new release, I would be posting my review, my comparison with the book, a week or less after the movie was released. The reason I'm posting it late, though, is because I actually had no intention of covering this movie here. I knew about its upcoming release, and I was interested in seeing it because I enjoy King Arthur movies. And I'm pretty sure I knew it was based on a poem, too. And yet, even though I knew that, I didn't have any intention of reading the poem. However, once I saw the movie, I... I saw it in theaters a few weeks after it was released, and I just loved it so much, and I was not expecting that. And it just kind of worked out because I had a day open, because I was supposed to post Flag Day today, the new Sean Penn movie. However, that is limited release, and it's not showing where I live, so I wasn't able to post that today, and so it gave me the opportunity to talk about The Green Knight instead. And it really all worked out for the best, because I ended up loving this poem, and I really enjoyed just doing this research and writing up this podcast. So yeah, really glad this happened. And before I get into a synopsis and then, you know, into full on spoilers, I want to just say once again, just I love this movie so much. You know, it's very mystical and has a creepiness to it that I wasn't expecting, but it wasn't scary, despite being maybe a little creepy at times. And I went into it knowing basically nothing about the story. And I think that is a great way to watch this movie. Everything, even things that may have been considered common knowledge, came to a surprise. And I just, there were so many things that happened that I did not expect. And when there's a movie I know I want to see, I avoid the trailers at all costs because I want to know as little as possible. And so many trailers give far too much away, especially this one. I watched it after I saw the movie and so much is revealed in the trailer for this movie. So if you haven't seen the movie, do not watch a trailer first. And if you're listening to this and you're debating whether or not you want to watch the movie, turn off this podcast, go watch the movie now, and then come back when you're done and listen to this, and it will help you better appreciate the film. But okay, now for a brief synopsis. So Gawain's mother, Morgan Le Fay, has the Green Knight approach King Arthur's court and challenges them to a blow in return for a blow, meaning a man can strike the Green Knight, and then a year and a day later, the Green Knight will get to strike the man back in return. Sounds a little silly, I know, but there you have it. So Gawain rises to the challenge and he beheads the Green Knight, only to have the knight pick up his head, and the head tells him to meet him in a year and a day at the Green Chapel where the Green Knight will return the blow. So about a year later, Gawain sets off on his quest to find the Green Chapel and face his fate of most likely being beheaded. So my thoughts on the book... Like I said, no one knows who actually wrote this poem, and though it was written sometime in the 1300s, it wasn't titled and officially published until 1839. The style of poetry isn't one that's done today. It's called a long line alliterative verse with a rhyming bob and wheel that divides it into stanzas. Although, even though it's a poem, it's written like a novel in a lot of ways with just how the story is and the perspectives. The version I read started with a section talking about the poem and its history, written by literary scholar Helen Cooper. And there's a quote where she says, The language of a novel, however, could never match the powerful rhythms and muscular texture of its alliterative verse, which the smoother patterns of modern English cannot reproduce in prose and only with difficulty in poetry. And so to give an example of this writing style, here's a section that is talking about the passing of the year. And it's a really just a beautiful section. That's why I chose it. 
And the movie also shows the passing of the year in a cool way because it does it by using a puppet show and they have that wheel behind the puppet show turning showing the passing of a year. But so this section reads, each new season turning in its time. After Christmas, the crabbed fasting time of Lent when people eat fish for meat and simple fare. And then the world's fresh weather fights with winter. Cold shrinks into the ground, clouds rise. Warm rain shuttles down in flashing showers over the flatlands. Flowers poke up, fields and grooves put on their freshest green. Birds start building, they call out loudly for the calm of summer that spreads its balm on alleys and slopes. Rich hawthorn blossoms swell and burst in rows on the cops. New birth sounds run pell-mell through the glorious full tree tops. And then broad summer with balmy winds out of the west breathe on bush and seed and plants under a wide sky dance in joy. When dew gathers and slips and drops from wet leaves as they bask in the sumptuous beams of the bright sun. Then autumn, with somber shadows striding towards winter, warning the grain to grow in fullness. On days he drives the rising dust up from the folding fields, where it spirals high. In the huge heavens, winds wrestle with the sun. Tawny leaves are ripped from the linden tree, and lush grass in the field leans over and graze. Whatever rose up earlier now ripens and rots. The year dwindles, all days seem yesterdays. Winter winds on as it will, as it has done of old. And when Michaelmas moons burns on the icy world, Gawain feels he must soon make his quest through the cold. So as I said, I had seen the movie before reading the poem, and so I kind of knew what to expect. The movie goes more in detail in some ways, and yet there is a lot to the poem, and I really enjoyed reading it. And as I said, it's a poem, but again, it's more like a short story because there's a lot to it. And there's a lot of symbolism and metaphors here, which I really liked, and a lot of symbolism in the movie too. But one example is in the poem when he's at the Lord and Lady's house in the poem, the wife enters his room three times and tempts him each morning. And each time she tempts him, tempts him, we are told also of the Lord and what he is hunting. And the scene is told from the perspective of the prey. And the third time she tempts him is especially mirrored by the hunt. And we'll get into that later. But so yeah, just a lot of beautiful symmetry and symbolism and all that stuff. And so going into this episode, I unintentionally kind of catered it to an audience that has seen the movie. I wrote it out in a non-linear fashion, like my outline is non-linear and I kind of jump around. And so if you haven't seen the movie, it might get confusing. If you've read the poem, it should be fine. And if you haven't read the poem and you haven't seen the movie, but you know the story, then you might be okay. But overall, this podcast is aimed towards an audience that has seen the movie and are looking for a better understanding of it and to know how it compares to the poem. So all listeners are welcome, of course, but I just wanted to give you that heads up. So onto the movie, David Lowry adapted the script and he was the editor and the director, so very hands-on. This film was supposed to be released earlier, but with COVID it was pushed back. And I'm really glad they waited for it to be able to be released in theaters rather than just have it be streaming because I saw it twice now, so I saw it in theaters, and then I read the poem, and then I watched it again at home. And seeing it in theaters was just such a cool experience, and it just is so immersive, and it makes you just feel in the movie. And there's actually, and there's like surprisingly not as much CGI as you might think in this, and they use a lot of old school movie magic and prosthetics and stuff. And to film some of the wide shots, Lowry also used the matte paint method. So... I have a picture on my blog, but for like for some of the wide shots, like in King Arthur's Court, the people on the outskirts are actually painted in afterwards. So that's kind of cool. So onto the acting, we have Def Patel in the lead role of Gwen. And if you have listened to my episode on Slumdog Millionaire or the movie Lion, you will know that I love Patel. He's a great actor and I absolutely loved him in this. And if he doesn't get an Oscar nomination, I am going to be so disappointed. Alicia Vikander is someone that I don't think I've talked about on here, but that's a shame because she is fantastic. Here she has two roles. She plays Essel, Gawain's girlfriend, as well as the lady who is the one that tempts him. And as Essel, she kind of has this like over the top accent, I thought, and it kind of annoyed me initially. Then when we see her as the lady, though, it made sense that she had this accent with Essel as a way to just further differentiate between the two. Joel Edgerton is the Lord, and he is great portraying this sort of like in the movie, he's kind of weird and eerie in a way. Uh, well, at the same time, like he seems like a nice guy who wants to help Gwen. And Egerton said that Lowry had him watch videos on YouTube of drunk British actors on talk shows, uh, which is funny, yet it's fitting. Like when I watched it the second time with that in mind, like I could totally see it. 
And then we have Sarita Chow Sarita Chowdhury is Gwen's mother, Morgan Le Fay, and she is a great actress. Initially, she actually wasn't in as much of this movie, but as they were filming, Lowry was just, he loved her. He was very impressed with her, and he just kept wanting more of her in the movie. And then we have Sean Harris and Kate Dickey, who play King Arthur and Guinevere. And in this movie, they have them be old and aging, and initially I found them kind of creepy, the way like their makeup is done. Yet, even with that appearance, they each bring a warmth and sincerity to the role. So, there is a lot to get into here. But I will start at the beginning, I guess, kind of. I'm going to start with Morgan Le Fay. So in both, we learned that Morgan Le Fay is behind this whole thing. She is Arthur's sister in both and was taught magic and witchcraft by Merlin. In Arthurian lore, she is Gwen's aunt, but in the movie, they had her be his mother instead. So more of a direct connection. And the character of Le Fay was invented by Geoffrey of Monmouth for his Vita Merlini, where she is a shapeshifter skilled in the arts of healing. And she is also given her place in the Arthurian orbit by Sheretian, who makes her Arthur's sister. And so also is sister to Gwen's own mother. And both are later redefined as Arthur's half-sisters, born to his mother by her first husband. And the prose romances degrade her here to an evil enchantress with particular hatred for Guinevere. And... This is, yeah, her dislike for Guinevere is mentioned in the poem, but in the movie we never really see that. So in the poem we have the Lord, who is named Bertilic. So in the poem we find out his actual name. However, in the movie he's just called the Lord. But anyway, in the poem Bertilic tells him how and why he is the Green Knight. Because also in the poem we are told directly that the Green Knight is the Lord. They're the same person. Whereas the movie never says that directly. Anyway, he is telling him how and why he is the Green Knight, and he says to Gwen, Through the power of Morgan Le Fay, part of my menage, by her wiles and witchcraft and her cleverness, she has mastered magic skills once kept by Merlin, for it is well known that long ago she fell in love with that wise wizard. He then tells her that Morgan Le Fay is actually back at his castle, and there is this old woman that is mentioned frequently who is with the lady, and he tells Gawain, he's like, yeah, that old lady that was with my wife, like, that's Morgan Le Fay. And so he invites Gawain back to say hello to her, but Gawain says that he would just rather go straight home instead. In the movie, there is this old woman who has a gauzy bandage wrapped around her eyes, and that gauzy bandage kind of clues us in to the fact that it's Morgan Le Fay watching him, but it's never said outright. And Morgan Le Fay we see wearing that gauzy bandage, so that's why by seeing it twice worn in the same way, we can assume that it's, you know, her way of watching what's happening. You know, and whether she's watching over him in a motherly way or if she's watching over him to make sure he does what he's supposed to isn't really made clear. I read in one review that this movie is all about a mother's love, ultimately. Le Fay has this whole thing happen so that Gawain can come home with honor and prove his worth and help him become a knight and later maybe even a king. But then in another perspective is that Le Fay is disappointed in her son and so she sends him on this quest to, like, get him to shape up. So... Either way, I guess it's done out of motherly love, and, but it just, yeah, I guess it's up to your own interpretation. And when we are introduced to the Green Knight in the movie, the scene is cut between what is happening with the Green Knight at the round table with Morgan Le Fay and her sisters casting the spell. David Lowry said they filmed the spell casting scene later, actually, because originally he wasn't going to make it so obvious that it was her doing and he said this scene, scene took the longest to edit, and he was working on it for a year before he was satisfied with the outcome, as it cuts back and forth. But it's a really cool scene, so it was worth it. So on the topic of the Christmas game, reading the story in our day and age, this whole Christmas game thing may not make much sense. However, it was more common back then, and that's just kind of what they have for entertainment, I guess. Uh, though this particular story is the first time they, there's talk of a beheading game, so... They had the blow for blow thing, but this is the first time a beheading game became a thing. And I was realizing though, this whole like blow for blow challenge from back then, like we still do that today if you think about it. Like how many times have you and someone else been like, okay, you can do this thing to me and then I get to do it back to you. And if the second person chickens out, the other person would get upset and they would find that person untrustworthy and disingenuous. So the challenge may not be given as formally as it is in this story, but we still do it today nonetheless. So on to Gawain. 
The movie shows him to be much more flawed than he was in the original story. For one, in the movie he isn't a knight yet. However, in the book he is. And as we will discuss later, he fails at many of the tests a knight is supposed to have passed. The movie also shows him missing mass, whereas in the book he always attended mass every morning. Before he leaves on his journey, the woman he has been seeing, named Essel, asks him to call her his lady, but he won't. So he's seeing her exclusively, yet he isn't willing to fully commit to her, probably because she isn't of noble birth or something. In the beginning, like the very beginning of the movie, it kind of makes it seem like she might be a prostitute because they're in a brothel. But if she is, it's never said outright. In the poem, though, he has already proven his knighthood. And when the Green Knight asks for someone to take his proposition, Gawain says humbly to King Arthur, I am the weakest and the least in wit. Loss of my life is therefore of little account. I am by birth your nephew. Besides that, nothing. My one virtue, your blood that runs in my veins. Since this affair is so foolish and unfit for you, and since I asked soonest, please leave it to me. When the year passes and it is time for Gawain to find the Green Chapel, in the movie he hadn't planned on going, saying to Arthur, but I thought it was just a Christmas game. Whereas in the poem, he stays true to the bargain, and it reads, After the meal, in gloomy mood, Gawain came to the king concerning his journey and said straight out, It is time, my lord, for me to take my leave of you. You know what it's about, and I'll not bother you with all my difficulties and the small details. I'm duty-bound to depart tomorrow without delay, to get my blow from the man in green as God decrees. When other knights question why he's going to face the fate of being beheaded, it reads, Gawain put on good cheer. Why should I hesitate, he said. Kind or severe, we must engage our fate. Though in the poem, once he leaves, the other knights mourn his leaving and say, similar to what Gawain says in the movie, they say, whoever heard of a knight heeding the counsel of capricious, or sorry, whoever heard of a king heeding the counsel of capricious knights and the nonsense of Christmas games. Even in the book, though, Gawain shows that he has his weaknesses. In Arthurian stories, Arthur and Lancelot are shown to be superior knights. And Helen Cooper says, It is Lancelot who is the central character after Arthur himself, or even in preference to Arthur. In the great Vulgate cycle of French prose romances of the 13th century, where Gawain slips even further down the ethical and chivalric scale to the point where he often functions as an antitype of good knighthood. In the poem, Gawain does have a character arc. He starts this quest speaking humbly of himself. Then when he returns, he is truly humbled by his downfalls and is less prideful. In the movie, though, I think his arc is even more pronounced because he failed so much more often in the poem, or sorry, he failed so much more often in the movie than he did in the poem. So when he finally makes the right decision, it just feels very satisfying to see him realize what is truly important. And so I wanted to talk about the pentacle slash the pentangle. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but so in the book, it describes the star specifically describes the star that all the knights wear, and it's called the pentangle, pentacle. It is considered a token of truth, and when someone wears it, it's a public display of their virtues, all of which a knight must possess. And so it's a star, and each point on the star symbolizes a virtue, and the five virtues are generosity, good fellowship, purity, courtesy, and compassion. In the movie, we see these knights wearing these, but it's never directly spoken of. And when you go into the movie knowing these five virtues a knight must prove, you can see that each person, like slash task, uh, Gawain comes across is testing one of these five virtues, and he fails each time. And speaking of his journey to the Green Chapel, in the poem, almost nothing is said of his travels until he reaches the castle of the Lord and Lady. Another quote by Helen Cooper reads, Knights are usually tested in armor on the battlefield rather than naked in bed as Gawain is or at least in combat with those dragons and boars that are either dismissed by the poet in half a line or fought by someone other than his hero. So this makes the poem really unique. All the book says about his journey is, it's hard to tell a tenth part of them all. Sometimes he wars with dragons or with wolves, with voodoos who watch him from woodland crags, with bulls and bears, sometimes with savage boars, the giants from high fells who followed him. Had he not been brave and sturdy, not served God, he would have died, been destroyed many times. So fighting a dragon or a wolf and showing his bravery and his physical abilities is not the focus here. Rather, focusing on where his heart is at and as he is, you know, as he's tested in his bedchamber. So very rare for a story of a knight to not focus on the seemingly more exciting battles he has, you know. A quick word on the giants, though. In the movie, he shows him coming across giants and he asks them if he can hitch a ride with them 
That way he will be able to arrive to his destination and not have to put much work in. The fox, though, howls and kind of sends the giants away. But also, after he asks this, a giant reaches to grab him and he flinches away anyhow. So I don't know if they were trying to pick him up to carry him along, but he was he was too scared for that even. But this whole scene brings to mind the phrase, on the shoulders of giants. So Gawain doesn't want to actually put the work in himself. He just wants to, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants and use the work of other people to attain what he needs to do kind of a thing. So I thought that was cool symbolism and metaphors or whatever. But the movie, unlike the poem, does show what he faces on his journey. And as said above, each one is a test of one of the chivalric codes. So to start, we have the scavengers. So his first test, he comes across a young man who is scavenging amongst dead bodies. And he strikes up a conversation with Gawain, and Gawain doesn't really say much in reply. He does ask the guy, though, if he knows the way to the Green Chapel, and the guy gives him directions. Gwen merely thanks him and continues on, and the scavenger, who is clearly poor, has to basically beg for payment. And this is a test of generosity, which Gawain fails, because for one, he wasn't even going to pay him anything. And two, when he does pay him, he pays him very little. And the main scavenger is played by Barry Keoghan, and... He's just, like, he's very off-putting and unsettling in his mannerisms, especially when they have Gawain tied up, and it makes me want to watch more with him. I've read that he is incredibly unsettling in The Killing of a Sacred Deer, but I haven't yet seen that. So after that, when he is freed from the binds the scavengers leave him in, he comes across an abandoned house. He is then approached by a ghost named Winifred, who, who says she needs him to retrieve her head from the bottom of a lake. And Gwen is very polite to her for the most part. However, before diving into the lake, he asks her, like, what's in it for me in exchange for getting your head? And so by having this attitude, he fails in having courtesy. So on to the lady. Staying at the house of the Lord and Lady happens in both book and movie. And so I will start with the movie version. So he's left alone with the lady who happens to also be played by the candor, the same woman who plays Essel. And... I took this to be done, like, to make the temptation even harder for him. So they spend the day together, and she gives him a book, of which she has many, and he takes it, he accepts it. And she also does a painting of him, and the painting is upside down, and, like, just kind of weird. And then the next morning, she is in, she comes into his bedroom, and she asks why he didn't go to her chambers last night. And he says that he wanted to, but, you know, he, he shouldn't. And so she tempts him again right there, and he once again says that he shouldn't. And it would be wrong, basically. And she then shows him the green sash and tells him that it will protect him from harm and asks if he wants it. And he says, yes, he does want it. And this scene goes on for like 30 seconds and it's very sexual. And she asks him, like as she's asking him if he wants the sash. And he ends up finishing, if you know what I mean. And she tells him, you are no knight and leaves the sash with him. In the book, though, there were a lot of other people staying at the castle. So during the day while the Lord was hunting, Gawain was hanging out with, like, all these other people rather than just spending the day with her like he did in the movie. And he stays there for three nights. And so on the first two mornings, she enters his room and she tries to seduce him. And they do have one kiss each morning and then they just talk. So in the book it says, The lady lured him on, enticing him to sin. But he held himself back so well no blemish appeared. There was no sin on either side. The third morning, she is dressed in more revealing clothing, and she offers him a ring. Like, well, at first she tries to seduce him, I think, and he says no. And then she offers him this really expensive ring, which he also refuses. She then offers him the green sash, or girdle. They often refer to it as a girdle, but it's like a sash, I guess. Anyway, she tells him it will protect him, and he gives in and he accepts it. Up until this point, he had been honest with the Lord, with the bargain they made. But when receiving the girdle, it reads... The knight, pondering her words, now began to wonder if it might be a talisman in his terrible plight when he came to the Green Chapel to get his gains. Maybe death could be foiled with this marvelous device. Patient now, as she pressed him, he allowed her to speak. She gave him the girdle once more, most eagerly. He accepted, and she granted the gift with goodwill, and besought him, for her sake, never to uncover it, but loyally to conceal it from her lord. He conceded. No one will know except themselves, no matter what the price. He thanked her time and time again for her gift and her advice. By then she had kissed Gwen the hardy, not once, but thrice. So each time he is tempted by her, the hunt is shown, and the first two times the Lord easily kills his prey, just as Gawain easily stays strong against temptation. 
However, the last hunt is a fox, which is more cunning and it is harder. It's a harder prey to catch. Just as this third temptation is a harder one to say no to. And the hunting scenes are unique because it's told from the perspective of the prey. And I actually, I originally had an excerpt from the scene with the fox being hunted, but I don't know. I felt like I had too many quotes from the book, so I got rid of it. But it's a really cool scene. But in talking about uh, this parallel, scholars have frequently noted the parallels between the three hunting scenes and the three seduction scenes in Gawain. They are generally agreed that the fox chase has significant parallels to the third seduction scene in which Gawain accepts the girdle from Bertolik's wife. Gawain, like the fox, fears for his life and is looking for a way to avoid death from the Green Knight Axe. The Green Knight's Axe. Like his counterpart, he resorts to trickery to save his skin. The fox uses tactics so unlike the first two animals, and so unexpectedly, that Bertilic has a harder time hunting it. Similarly, Gawain finds the lady's advances in the third seduction scene more unpredictable and challenging to resist than her previous attempts. She changes her evasive language, typically of courtly love relationships, to a more, more assertive style. Her dress, relatively modest in earlier scenes, is suddenly voluptuous and revealing. And the movie doesn't show the hunt. Instead, the first day it shows a painting of a fox hunt, and then later it shows a painting of a man seemingly being hunted. So that's how they show the parallel of those two. So on to the Lord. In the poem, the Lord seems like a happy guy, and he and the others in the castle were excited about having a knight of the round table stay with them. And it says, They presented themselves without ado because all virtue, excellence, strength, and good breeding belong to this reputable person praised everywhere, whose honor was held highest above all men. And each man said quietly to his companion, Now we shall see a marvelous show of manners and learn from the intricate turns of his conversation. Without even seeking, we'll see just what good talk can be, for the Prince of Courtesy walks among us. Surely God has showered his grace on us in granting us such a guest as Gawain at the season when all earth sing the birth of God above. And in the movie, too, they had heard of Gawain because talk of his beheading the Green Knight had spread. And so while hanging out that first evening in the poem, the Lord excitedly proposes a bargain between he and Gwen, And he says, let's settle on a bargain. Whatever I win at hunting will henceforth be yours. And you, in turn, will yield whatever you earn. There, my fine fellow, swear on it truly, whether we win or lose. And the first two mornings, the only thing Gwen receives, which he then needs to give to the Lord, is a kiss from the lady. And so after that first morning of temptation, when he and the lady have one kiss, uh, that he meets up with the Lord after he's been hunting, and he's impressed with, you know, the, the prey that the Lord has caught. And the Lord says, I give them all to you, Gawain, was the Lord's answer. Our contract agrees that you claim them as your own. That's right, he replied. And I say the same to you. What I have won with all honor here in your hall is yours indeed, as we agreed. I give it with good will. Now he clasps him with both arms around the neck and kisses him as courteously as he can. There, take my trophies, for I got no more than that. Had they been greater, I'd gladly give them to you. And this happens on the second day as well, because once again, Gwen and the lady kiss, and so he kisses the Lord in return to give him what he received. And in the movie, Gawain is hurriedly leaving after receiving the girdle, and on his way out, he passes the Lord. And in the movie, they made that same bargain. And so the Lord asks if there is nothing Gawain needs to give him, and Gawain says no. And the Lord says that there is, and then he approaches Gawain and he kisses him. And when I saw this the first time, like not having read the poem, I thought this seemed a little odd. And I just thought that the Lord and Lady were just each desiring him, basically. But now, I, I guess Lowry included that scene since it was in the poem. But it also does just kind of add to the weirdness of his stay in the movie. In the book, there's nothing weird about his stay with the Lord and Lady, really. But in the movie, there's definitely this like weird undertone to it all. But Gawain not keeping his bargain with the Lord to give him whatever he may receive in the house is him failing in good fellowship. And then in the movie, he also ejaculates, which shows his failure in purity slash chastity. And then the way he treats Essel before leaving, not claiming her as someone he would marry, then again denying her in front of the lady, could be seen as him lacking the fifth virtue of compassion. So as far as the green girdle slash sash, so in the poem, they'll often call it a girdle, but it's, yeah, it's a sash. So in the movie, Morgan Le Fay is the one who first gives him the girdle, and it is a, it's then stolen by the scavenger, and so then it's later given to him by the lady. And I was trying to figure out why Lowry had Gwen's mother give it to him first. 
I, yeah, I don't know. Like, in the movie, it made more sense that he would want that green sash from the lady because he's like, oh, like, that's what my mom gave me. Yeah, I want that. But I don't know, in the poem, he had no connection to that green sash. He just thought it would save his life, and so he took it. The green sash, though, has a lot of symbolic meaning. For starters, you can compare it to the pen- pentacle. So the pentacle is an endless knot that can't be undone, whereas the sash can be tied and untied, showing that it is not firm. And the sash also represents witchcraft and magic, whereas the pentacle represents honor and Christianity. In the poem, it clearly states Godwin's belief in the girdle, which shows his lack of faith and placing his life above honor. And the quote says, But he wore the green belt not for its beauty, nor for its pendants all neatly polished, nor for the gold that glinted on its end knots, but to save himself when it behooved him to suffer and to stand defenseless against death when he met that man again. In the movie, the sash is made by Le Fay, so we can assume it did have magical qualities. In the poem, though, we can assume it was just a normal cloth because there's nothing to prove that it would actually save him. And like quite the contrary, giving it up is what would have helped him in the end. In the book, accepting this and accepting this girdle and not giving it to the Lord as he promised is his only failure in the story. And this makes the story unique for, as Helen Cooper says, it is commonplace for a knight to commit some kind of failure early in his quest and then to atone for it and move beyond it. But Gawain's discovery of his fault is itself the climactic moment of this quest, when atonement is not an option within the story. And so when he returns to Camelot in the poem, he's contrite about what has happened, and it's contrasted with his, you know, his elaborate, seemingly humble speech at the beginning, when he, uh, you know, says he'll fight the Green Knight. And so he ends up returning sadder, wiser, and deeply humiliated. His kinship with Arthur had seemed a guarantee of excellence, of everything that separates the civilization of the court from the huge and alien green figure who disrupts the feast. His equal kinship with Morgan insists that whatever it is that the Green Knight represents, it is deeply in his blood as Arthur's courtliness and nobility. And so he now feels true humility and views the sash as a sign of his shame and his faults. Before leaving the Green Knight, Gawain tells him, As for your girdle, said Gwain, God reward you, I shall bear it with the best will, not for its gleaming gold, not for its fine knotted cloth, not for its many pendants, not because of its cost or its handsome handiwork, but I shall see it always as a sign of my fault wherever I ride, remembering with remorse in times of pride how feeble is the flesh, how petty and perverse, what a pestilent hutch and house of plagues it is, inviting filth, and if my vanity flare up, when I shall see this lovelace, it will humble me. And when he's back at the court, he tells them something very similar, saying, Look, my lord, he said, touching the love token. This band belongs with the wound I bear on my neck, sign of the harm I've done and the hurt I've duly received for covetousness, covetousness and cowardice, for succumbing to deceit. It is a token of untruth, and I am trapped in it and must wear it everywhere while my life lasts. No one can hide without disaster a harmful deed. What's done is done and cannot be undone. And his fellow knights admire his humility and his honesty for this, And they decide to all wear a green girdle similar to his so that they may also be reminded of the fallibility of men and to help them stay true to their oaths. And it also, like, they end up kind of honoring Gawain by wearing one. In the movie, when he is at the Green Chapel, he becomes, you know, too cowardly and he runs away. And he returns to Camelot. And there is a 15-minute segment at the end of the movie that has no talking at all. And it is showing how his life turned out due to his cowardly act and lying about it upon his return. And so when he returns, he never takes off that sash and he's wearing it always, symbolizing his secret shame about what he has done. It shows him with Essel and he isn't even able to look her in the face. And even when it shows them having sex, he isn't able to look her in the face. And she ends up having their baby, which he takes, and then he abandons her. And as time passes, he is an unloved king and, you know, people are throwing stuff at him in the street. And his son ends up dying in battle. And at the end, his castle is being taken over by enemies, which, by the way, he ended up becoming king because he was Arthur's successor. He was the next of kin. But anyway, so as he is waiting for the enemies to enter, he looks down and finally removes the green sash. And when he does so, it results with his head falling off. We are then brought back to the green chapel, and we see that that was a vision of what would happen if Gawain gave in to those temptations and the kind of man he would have become. So he realizes that having integrity and honor is more important than keeping his own life. And so then he tells the Green Knight to wait, and he removes the sash, and then he says that he is ready. And so after this, the Green Knight says, well done, brave knight, and then says, now off with your head. 
But that last line is said in more of a joking way, I thought, like more of a, like more endearing, I guess. And so the movie cuts there and we don't know what happens, but I don't think Wayne actually gets his head chopped off. I think he passed the test and so the Green Knight will let him live. And with the Green Knight, in the book, we learned that the Green Knight is the Lord, Bertelik, and the whole thing was planned by Morgan Le Fay. In the movie, we know that it's planned by Morgan Le Fay, but it's never straight out said that the Green Knight is the Lord. And when Gwen reaches the Green Chapel, he's sitting there in front of the Green Knight, and we see the face of, I think we see King Arthur as well, but we also see Morgan Le Fay and the Lord flash over the face of the Green Knight. And so this, you know, shows their involvement, all of their involvement in the test. And as far as the color green, a lot of people have studied and debated why green. And in the movie, the lady asks this very question and she proceeds to give a monologue on what green represents. And she says, red is the color of lust, but green is what lust leaves behind in heart and womb. Green is what is left when ardor fades, when passions die, when we die too. When you go, your footprints will fill with grass. Moss shall cover your tombstone tombstone. And as the sun rises, green shall spread all over in all its shades and hues. The verdigree will take over your swords and your coins and your battlements and try as you might, all you hold dear will succumb to it. Your skin, your bones, your virtue. And this monologue goes on for a while and it's really well done. But on the Wikipedia page for the Green Knight, it says, given the varied and even contradictory interpretations of the color green, its precise meaning in the poem remains ambiguous. In English folklore and literature, green was traditionally used to symbolize nature and its associated attributes, fertility and rebirth. Stories of the medieval period also use it to allude to love and the base desires of man. Because of its connection with fairies and spirits in early English folklore, green also signified witchcraft, devilry, and evil. It can also represent decay and toxicity. When combined with gold, as with the green knight and his girdle, green was often seen as representing youth's passing. In Celtic mythology, green was associated with misfortune and death, and therefore avoided in clothing. The green girdle, originally worn for protection, became a symbol of shame and cowardice. It was finally adopted as a symbol of honor by the Knights of Camelot, signifying a transformation from good to evil and back again. This displays both the spoiling and regenerative connotations of the color green. There is a possibility, as Alice Buchanan has argued, that the color green is erroneously attributed to the Green Knight due to the poet's mistranslation or misunderstanding of the Irish word glass, which could either mean gray or green. So really, it's up to your own interpretations as to what the green signifies, because I feel like you could make an argument for a lot of these, like rebirth, death, life, witchcraft, uh, like all of these could fit the meaning. But I thought it was interesting too, the idea that the author meant the color gray instead and it's just been mistranslated but I think green is a far more intriguing color and so I'm glad that he's green not gray so when the green knight approaches the court the poem reads they'd seen strange things but never a sight like this they thought it must be sort of a sort of magic or a dream most of the men were too terrified to reply struck dumb by his words they waited stock still in the movie the scene is much creepier with the queen like becoming possessed as she reads his letter But nonetheless, we can see from that line that his presence is still uncomfortable in the poem and it caused unease. And none of the knights step forward and are too fearful. And Cooper says of this scene, the green knight by engaging with the greatest knight of Camelot also reveals the moral weakness and pride of all of Camelot and therefore all of humanity. However, the wounds of Christ believing to offer, believed to offer healing to wounded souls and bodies are mentioned throughout the poem in the hope that this sin of prideful stiff nakedness will be healed among fallen mortals. After no one accepts his challenge, the poem continues with the Green Knight saying, Where are your boasts and valor now? Your bold victories, your pride, your prizes, your wrath and rousing words. Am I right? All the pageantry and power of the round table made nothing by the words of one man? You're all white with fear and not a whack fallen. And he laughed so loud the king blanched with anger. Then his brow darkened in shame, his face flesh blood dim. He grew as wild as the wind, the whole hall turned grim. Then, being of noble kind, the king strode up to him and replied, By heaven, sir, your request is very silly, but as you ask for a silly thing, I'll see you have it. No man here is scared by what you've said. Give me your great battle axe, and in the name of God, I'll easily provide what you've pleaded for. He leaps down lightly, seizes the man's hand, who also dismounts in high disdain. And from here, as we talked about, Gawain gives his humble speech and offers to take up the Green Knight's challenge. 
And this is similar to the movie because the knights don't do anything and Arthur says that he wishes he could be the one to take up the challenge. However, he is too old and his body won't let him. And so then Gwen steps up and he's not even a knight. But so he takes takes up the challenge and Arthur lets him borrow Excalibur. And then in the poem, when he finds the Green Chapel, it reads, The Green Chapel, Lord, what a sight, a place more likely where in the dark of midnight the devil says morning prayer, an utter desert, muttered Gawain. What a desolation with its sinister shrine and tufts of weed everywhere, a fitting spot for that fellow in his green gown to do his devil's rites and unholy duties. All of my five senses say it is the fiend who's brought me down here to destroy me. What an unhappy place, an evil chapel, devil take this accursed church, the worst I've ever chanced on. And in the book and movie, Gawain initially flinches away as the Green Knight is about to bring down his axe. In the poem, when he does this, the Green Knight says, You're not Gawain, he said, so noble and so good. He's not afraid of a whole army by Hill or Dale, and now you tremble in terror even before I touch you. I never knew he was such a lily-livered knight. Did I flinch or flee from you when your blow felled me? Did I cavil or create a fuss at King Arthur's house? My head flew to my feet, but I never flickered an eyebrow. And you, I have even touched you in your trembling. It's clear that I'm the better man here. The case is black and white. Gawain replied, Enough. I won't flinch when you hack, though once my head is off, I cannot put it back. But swing promptly, man, and bring me to your point. Deliver me to my destino- destiny, and I won't delay. I'll stand up to your stroke and start away no more till your steel strike me squarely. That's my oath on it. Here is your bargain, then. He heaved the blade up high and gazed at him savagely as if somewhat crazed. And this is kind of shown in the movie, too, when... He flinches and the Green Knight is like, I didn't flinch when, you know, when you did this to me and whatever. And you've had a whole year to find courage. And Gawain is like, you know, one year, a hundred years, like there's not enough time to have the courage to face your death, basically. Uh, And in the poem, the Green Knight brings his blade down three times, the first two times causing no harm. And the third time he does strike his neck, leaving a cut, but not killing him. And he tells Gawain, and at this point, Gawain knows that the Green Knight is the Lord. And so he says to Gwen, when you behaved well in my hall and gave me all your winnings as a wise and ma- as a wise and good man must, in the second stroke I dealt you for that day when you kissed my wife and returned my rights to me. My arm missed both times, mere feints, no harm to show. Who pay their debts can rest quite unafraid. And so, because you failed the test the third time, you took that blow. For that woven garment you wear is my own girdle. My wife wove it so I know it well. I have missed no facts concerning your acts and kisses, nor my wife's swimming of you. I brought it all about. I sent her to test you out. You withstood her stoutly. You're the most faultless warrior who walks on foot. Yet here you lacked a little. Your loyalty was wanting, not out of greed, not out of wantonness, but because you loved your life. And I blame you much less for that. And the first words he spoke were these, meaning Gwen. A curse upon my cowardice and my covetedness. There's villainy in both and virtue killing vice. He grasped the love knot and loosened its clasp and hurled it in hard anger towards the man. There, take that tawdry love token. Bad luck to it. Craven fear to your blow and cowardice brought me to give it to, to give in to my greed and go against myself in the noble and generous code of knightly men. I am proved false. Faulty. Those failings will haunt me. From falsehood to faithlessness come a hollow heart and ill fame. And I confess to you that I am much to blame. What would you have me do that I may cleanse my name? The Lord laughed and replied reasonably and warmly. Any harm you've done is now undone. You've clearly confessed and freed yourself of fault. You've paid your penance at the point of my blade. Hold you absolved of all offense, as fresh made as if since birth, you have never sinned on earth. And I give you back the girdle with the golden border. It's green like my gown, so take it, Gawain, to reclaim, to recall the contest when you ride away among proud princes as an emblem to remember your quest and challenge. So yeah, so in the poem, it's a bit different from the movie because he keeps the sash on and the green knight does hit him, but it's just like a nick on his neck. And so he will forever have this scar on his neck showing this wrong he's done. And back then they thought that like physical scars and physical deformities or whatever were signs of inward sin. And so that's what this scar represents is a sin that he has committed. And when the challenge is offered at Camelot in both the book and movie, the Green Knight says that whoever accepts after they meet again at the Green Chapel, they shall part in trust and friendship. And that certainly does come to pass in both the book and the movie. Like in the book, they have quite a long conversation after the fact when he realizes that it's the Lord and uh, and they become friends. And then even in the movie, when he says the line, you know, well done, brave knight. And he just has this really, uh, like he respects him now. And this, yeah, so they have that friendship and trust. 
And then lastly, I wanted to talk about the fox very briefly. So it is common in stories like this to have a quest animal. And in the book, he has his horse, which is with him throughout the whole story. However, in the movie, his horse is stolen from him. And then this fox shows up and starts joining him on this journey. And as they near the green chapel in the movie, the fox tempts him to leave by saying he faces certain death and that he should just run away. And Gawain says that he has to go on and that, you know, he's going to face the green knight. And then the fox says, like, well, in that case, take off that green girdle. And Gwen says, no, and it's a gift. I'm like, I'm wearing it because it's a gift. And so he's claiming that he doesn't believe it'll save him, but he secretly does believe it and he is refusing to take it off. In the book, the Lord sends an aide to help Gawain find the green chapel. And as they get close, it's this man who tells Gawain that he should not go any further. And in the poem, the man tells him, I'll hurry home meanwhile, and I promise and swear by God and all his good saints, and by the holy relics and all else, to keep your secret loyally, to tell no one you ran from any knight or any man that's known to me. And then Gawain says, Many thanks, he murmured, then replied somewhat dryly, I'm touched by your care for my welfare. I wish you well, I'm sure you'd keep my secret quite securely, but however firmly you held it, should I fail here and scuttle off, fleeing in fright as you suggest, I'd be a fraud and a coward and could not be forgiven. No, I shall go to the chapel, whatever happens, and say, and say to the man you speak of, whatever I wish, come foul, fortune, or good, wherever my fate might dwell. Tough he may be, his arm might wield a club that can kill, but the Lord will save from harm all those who serve him well. And the line, the line, should I fail here and scuttle off, fleeing in fright as you suggest, I'd be a fraud and a coward and could not be forgiven. That line is what must have inspired the scene in the movie where he does just that, and he is cowardly and runs away and he lives... The life of a fraud in that vision he has. Uh, also in that line, it's interesting that Gwen says, but the Lord will save from harm all those who serve him well. So he's saying he has faith in the Lord, and yet he's still choosing to wear the girdle, which he also thinks will protect him, like using witchcraft. So kind of interesting. But this podcast has gone on long enough, so I guess I should wrap things up. So as far as book or movie, you know, I loved both so much. I love the symbolism and the metaphors, and I love the moral of the story. The movie is just so incredibly beautiful and such amazing cinematography and the camera work, and the score is also amazing. Like, it's a mix of medieval music, but also, like, it can have this unnerving score at times. And this was filmed in Ireland, and so some of the scenes, like, they are sets. But it is filmed where real castles exist, and so Joel Egerton talked about how cool that was to just you feel like you're so in it. Like it's not a green screen, they're actually there. And Lowry stays true to the overall theme of the poem while still adding his own artistic take to some aspects of it. And I love the poem and I highly recommend reading it, but ultimately I think I will have to say that the movie wins and I just, I love it even more. It's just so well done in literally every way. Like I have zero complaints. But again though, the poem is really good and there's a lot to get from the poem too. So I like both, but the movie I prefer overall. And I will end this with a quote I really like by the director and scriptwriter David Lowry. He said, as a filmmaker, it's really important to remind myself constantly that the movies I make aren't all that important. Someday they won't exist anymore. Someday they'll all fall away and they won't be around. They won't survive me as long as I sometimes think they will. And so more important than the legacy I'm creating for myself with my body of work, is the way I comport myself as I make them, the integrity in which I live my life and my attempts to be a good person to do good in this world. I wanted that to be one of the central points because here is a character who has a tremendous legacy laid out ahead of him. He is related to King Arthur, one of the greatest kings of medieval history. He could be the successor of the throne, but it was important for me to make sure that his journey carried him to a place where he realized that more important than that legacy was the idea of being a human being with integrity and goodness in their heart. And that is what I wanted to convey in The Green Knight. So yeah, thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I hope I made sense. I'm worried I (laughs) jumped around and was confusing. But like I said, if you've seen the movie, I think this podcast made sense. And I hope it helped you better understand the meaning of it. And this movie is kind of polarizing. I think it has like two and a half stars out of five. So literally 50% on IMDb. I'm not sure what it has on Rotten Tomatoes, actually. But I think the people who gave it bad reviews just... I don't know, they didn't take the time to understand it. And I think once you see the meaning and the symbolism, then I think 
you would love it. <laughs> like I, yeah, like how can you not love a story like this? It's such a great moral. And that final scene when he takes the sass, sash off and he says, I'm ready. And then the Green Knight says, well done. It's, yeah, I just, uh, I just love it so much. It's such a great movie. And this makes me want to watch more of David Lowry movies. This, I had never heard of him before. Like I'd heard of the other movies he'd done, but he's definitely going to be on my radar from here on out. And I just love that last quote by him. And yeah, this is just such an amazing story. And I really loved it. And I hope you guys loved hearing me talk about it. So I will see you next week. Thanks for listening.